is off you go thank you right so as uh, the slide shows it's the background we is a picture of cleveland clinic where we all worked there and i work in the pain department there so why did we choose this topic as we all know it's a very it's a very common condition we see in the pain clinics and uh, it is it is mostly overlooked and underdiagnosed which has which leads to uh, it's it's because you know there is uh, there is there's a lack of uh, any internationally validated criteria which leads to delay in the diagnosis and then it will cause uh, a significant burden on the society in terms of patient suffering. So next is what is myofascial pain syndrome? So uh, still uh, Siemens gave the definition in 1999, it still holds true that myofascial pain syndrome is a complex of sensory, motor and autonomic symptoms that are caused by a myofascial trigger points in the muscles. So there's another confusion regarding myofascial pain versus musculoskeletal pain. See, all the muscul musculoskeletal pain comprises all the pain related to uh, muscles and bones, but vice versa is not true. Myofascial pain is a syndrome, a specific syndrome that is caused by presence of trigger points within the muscles or their fascia. So we should not confuse myofascial pain with the musculoskeletal pain. So now what are the trigger points? Trigger points, they are sp spots of excused tenderness and hyper irritability in muscles or their fascia localized in a taut or a palpable bands. So trigger points are pedagogic of the myofascial pain. So when we find trigger points in a muscle, it, it means that we are dealing with a myofascial pain syndrome. So the another quality of trigger points is that when we palpate, when we put when you press on, when you put a pressure on the trigger points, it could, it could, it should cause you local twitch response, either with a pressure or with a needle. So, what is the prevalence of this condition? As you see, the lifetime prevalence is eighty-five percent. So, very, very common condition we found in pain clinics. Even twenty-one percent of general orthopedic population coming to the clinics is from myofascial pain, and in our pain clinics, the 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 prevalence can reach up to 85% to 93%. It's most commonly found in women, in elderly adults. And the sites which are commonly found in myofascial pain syndromes are the neck, shoulders, and back. Uh, it's a leading cause of tension type headaches and the facial pain. Patient coming for uh, the myofascial pain, in, it's lead to uh, you know, typical type of headaches, frontal headaches and the headaches because of the uh, masseter muscles, a spasm there. So there's typical, uh, when we are seeing this, it's very common in a certain group of uh, patients like the athletes who are overusing and who are using repeated movements of a certain group of muscles, like uh, similarly with the hard physical labors. And also it is due to the static, uh, you know, the muscles get uh, like incidentary workers, uh, which is because of, a, uh, you know, uh, basically decreased use of muscles, leading to static injury to the muscles, leading to myofascial pain. So it, it is, myofascial syndrome can happen either from overactivity or inactivity. Similarly, in the musculoskeletal pain group, 46% are found to be because of myofascial uh, pain syndrome. And they found uh, in 46% patient, you will find myofascial trigger points. So myofascial trigger points, they can be active or they can be latent. Active trigger points are those points which provoke spontaneous pain. Whereas latent trigger points are those which have all the characteristics of the active trigger points like thought band, local twitch response, but they are silent. So when you're doing a clinical examination, sometimes when you're palpating, you will find these, uh, the patient will complain of pain, then you will be able to find these latent trigger points. Active trigger points also have the active loci, which is uh, small spots areas with abnormal electrical activities. So it is because of uh, spontaneous electric activity in the motor end plates, 
which can cause uh, which will we, we find in EMGs which can cause later which can cause chronic contraction of these muscle bundles. What is thought band? The thought band is thought to be composed of several trigger points. So if we have a bunch of a bundle of trigger points in a muscle, then it will lead to formation of thought band. And obviously it will cause excessive and pit potential activity. So trigger point can also be seen can be designated as a primary trigger point and a secondary trigger point. So primary trigger point is basically in the uh, local muscle where that where which has been exposed to insult or repetitive use, where secondary is might you will find secondary trigger point in any other muscle which is distant to the primary muscle, which can these trigger points can be induced either by neurogenically because of central sensitization or due to abnormal posture. Uh, which can be, uh, which which might mechanically cause another trigger point in distant muscle, but the nociceptive focus in this distant trigger points is in some in some different muscle, not in the uh, local muscle there, and this nociceptive can be deep, somatic, or visceral. Now, what is satellite phenomena? Well, satellite phenomena is that sometimes you find a trigger point in one particular muscle, but then the patient will complain of pain in some other group of muscles. For example, if you press, if you put pressure on a triceps, a low, a long head of triceps, patient will complain of sudden spasm over the trapezius muscle. And then you remove this uh, pressure, patient will uh, get better, uh, the pressure will be released, patient will get better. So this is how you find out the set, uh, this uh, satellite trigger points, which is called a satellite phenomena. So you can see here, for example, the trigger point is in the little side of neck, but patient will complain of pain all over the temporis area and the, you know, the little aspect of the neck. Similarly, these are the series of trigger points on the little aspect of the neck, which cause referred pain or in the head, in the occipital area, as well as uh, in the temporal area. Here also an example, the, the trigger point you find is in the, over the scapula, but the patient will complain of pain all over the upper extremity. Similarly, you can see down here, the trigger point is in latissimus dorsi here, but the patient will complain of pain in the buttocks. So whenever you see these patients with a myofascial pain syndrome, you should always try to palpate those trigger points in the surrounding area. And most of the time you will be able to find those points. And then when you treat these points, the patient will have a benefit in the referred area also. What is a diagnostic criteria? So, uh, due to lack of internationally criteria, you know, does this uh, criteria given by Siemens in 1999 still holds true? But uh, it says that if you have five major criteria and one minor criteria, you can the you can it will satisfy the uh, myofascial pain syndrome definition. But for clinical purposes, if you have like for the major criteria, if you have the patient will complain of localized spontaneous pain. And the spontaneous pain is not only in the local muscle, but also the patient will complain of this pain in the referred area, which is specific for that particular trigger point. You find when you palpate, you will find a taut palpable band in that particular muscle for that myofascial pain syndrome. You'll, uh, when you palpate it, patient will complain of pain and tenderness along that uh, muscle spindle or a taut band, and there would be certain degree of reduced range of movement with that, in that particular region where a patient has this myofascial spasm. Myocardia includes reproduction of a spontaneously perceived pain and alter sensation by pressure on the trigger point. When you, when you put pressure on that, when you put pressure, there will be local twitch response, which can be observed clinically or sometimes by the ultrasound. And when you inject any local anesthetic, the patient will, uh, will uh, report ban relief in the pain. So, but the, if, even if you find, I mean, for clinical purposes, even if you, if you find a taut band and patient is complaining of a spontaneous production of pain, even you can, and you can diagnose myofascial pain syndrome because uh, still there's a lack of, uh, you know, internationally, well, the criteria. So we, these two uh, signs are enough to diagnose myofascial pain syndrome. 
what is etiology? Etiology is still completely misunderstood. I mean, not completely understood. So there could be a multiple reasons for which can cause myofascial pain syndrome. There could be uh, acute muscle injury, or there could be minimal, very minor, minor traumas due to repetitive use of that particular group of muscles by overusing them, or there, there might be history of intense cooling of that group of muscles. Ergonomics is very important. Patient might be have a poor posture, sitting posture, or patient might have, uh, you know, sometimes patient tell that uh, because of carrying phone, you know, to, to release their arms, they put the phone between their, it's very common, this for the, especially for the neck, my neck region, patient is holding phone in a, you know, wrong way. Structural could be like, Patient might have uh, osteoarthritis. Patient might have thoracokyphosis, uh, scoliosis. Patient might have limb strength, uh, shortening, which, when, which will cause imbalance in the muscles, uh, putting more pressure on one particular group of muscles, leading to myofascial pain syndrome. Psychological stress, another thing, which can cause uh, myofascial pain syndrome, insufficient ins insomnia, over fatigue. And there are certain systemic conditions which can lead to uh, myofascial pain syndrome, like hormonal changes, hypothyroidism, menopause, nutritional deficiencies like vitamin D and iron deficiencies, like uh, and chronic infection. So there is multiple etiology, multiple factors which can cause uh, myofascial pain syndrome, but common conditions are the local conditions, like which put more stress over local myofascial uh, particular region. You know. So what is the pathophysiology? There are different theories given up for this. The most common theory which uh, explains is the local hypoxia and energy crisis theory. Due to sustained contraction of the muscle or sustained pressure on one particular group of muscles, there is continuous sarcomere contraction leading to compression, leading to decreased, you know, uh, pressure, more pressure on the vascular supply, capillary blood vessels leading to compression and uh, which cause hypoxia, limiting oxygenation, and this will cause imbalance in the uh, basically metabolic imbalance in the mitochondria, leading to decreased production of the ATPs. And these ATPs are very important because they cause uh, they are uh, because of this they there's decreased degrade, degradation of the acetylcholine and increased availability of acetylcholine, which will cause prolonged muscle contraction. And also decreased ATP will cause re decreased reuptake of calcium into the sarcoplasm reticulum, leading to increased availability of calcium in the sarcomere, leading to, again, leading to prolonged contraction. So local hypoxia, this is called local hypoxia and energy crisis theory. Another thing is role of peripheral and central sensitization. And uh, local muscle injury will lead to release of plethora of inflammatory mediators like substance P, uh, calcitonin generated products, whereas um, these uh, cytokines, so this, all these uh, local uh, mediators, inflammatory mediators, they will cause sensitization of the peripheral sensory nociceptors leading to, they will cause a local uh, sensory phenomena because of my, in myofascial pain syndrome like pain, hyperalgesia, and allodynia. Similarly, these inflammatory mediators it also causes uh, stimulation of uh, primary nociceptors, which in lead to cause release of glutamate and aspartate, and also cause stimulation of WDR uh, neurons in dorsal root ganglion, as well as in trigeminal nucleus, which in turn cause a central sensitization, leading to neuronal hyperexcitability hyper and hyperactivity. So this is the reason for the referred pain in myofascial pain syndrome. So pain, the, the injury insult is somewhere else and you, the patient will complain of pain uh, in other areas which are completely normal. And it, so, uh, see the trivial reason like posture, you know, improper posture can lead to central sensitivity. See the whole process. So that's why it's very important to treat this condition in a uh, biopsychosocial model. And to prevent, and once there is central sensitization, the small this this condition is very difficult to treat. Another theory is electrophysiological hypothesis is same thing, uh, because of 
sustained contraction of the muscle, there is electrical depolarization on the end plates, leading to um, excessive amounts of acetyl release of uh, release of excessive amounts of acetyl choline at the motor end plate, leading to increase, which cause downstream more activity of sodium channels and more availability of intracellular calcium concentrations and leading to prolonged contractions. There's another theory, muscle spindle theory, which, which is like due to muscle injury or a muscle spindle injury, there's an activation of a sympathetic system leading to release of uh, adrenergic compounds like norepinephrine, which again cause contraction of the muscle spindle or muscles and leading to uh, hypoxia and again leading to energy crisis and uh, this hypoxia theory. So this is a nice chart, depicting all these factors you can see here, uh, simple bad posture, you know, or muscle overuse can lead to muscle overload, which again cause like energy crisis can cause ischemic and hypoxia leading to release of different inflammatory mediators and um, low pH due to hypoxia, uh, which certainly leads to higher acetylcholine and later on causing uh, availability of more calcium in, in the sarco sarcomere and causing muscle contraction. Similarly, you can see uh, these can release, uh, these mediators can cause activation of loss chapters in uh, dorsal horns leading to central sensitization later on. Similarly, uh, like electrophysiological theory influence, same increased, high, um, increased muscle load will cause ischemia and cause stimulation of uh, motor end plates leading to high acetylcholine and similarly causing muscle contractions. So this is a large chart which is you know, integrated, which has integrated, integrated all theories in one picture. Again, is like you have these multiple reasons which I have explained, which I have explained in my previous slide, like medical conditions, different medical conditions, musculoskeletal conditions, lack of exercise, posture abnormalities, endocrine conditions, which will cause more stress on the normal muscle leading to taut muscle band and leading to latent trigger point. This is called little trigger point is a preclinical condition, which eventually if not treated lead to active trigger points and causing myofascial pain syndrome. What are the clinical manifestations? Clinical history and examination is a very important part when you're going for, I mean, which will help us in diagnosis of the myofascial pain syndrome. So clinical history is the first step. You should talk to the patient about his lifestyle, occupation, about his level of activities. Age is also important because it is uh, very common in elderly adults. Uh, they, you, you'll find any history of repetitive movements. You will find, in uh, basically in sport people, I mean, um, because of over activity use, over active use of one particular group, hobby. So this will give, the clinical history will give you an idea about uh, the reason for a myofascial pain syndrome in particular group of muscles. Now, physical examination, uh, we'll go ahead, okay. So uh, symptoms, basically the patient will complain of pain particular in that particular region where he has this pain. The pain is, the patient will complain of burning pain. Patient might complain of uh, like electric pain. Pain can be very, patient can, patient might have, uh, basically the pain is like expansion pain, like, sorry, I don't know what's going on with this. Okay. So a patient might, at the same time, patient might complain of referred pain also. So uh, the pain basically is, it might range from mild to moderate, burning type. I mean, the patient might have, you know, patient pain may, come, may complain of pain which is acute, or it might be chronic also for many months. This, you will find some stiffness. Patient will complain of decreased range of motion of that particular group of muscles and stiffness. You'll find, you might find autonomic symptoms like. I don't know why this slide is, sorry for this. 
patient might complain of autonomic symptoms like sweating in that particular area, pyloreaction, patient pallor, uh, might have proprioceptive disorder also, patient may complain of imbalance because of this. Especially in head and neck, the patient might complain of tinnitus and vertigo. He have, a patient might have history of depression, which is very common in these patients, and uh, poor sleep. So you should, when you, these, these are a plethora of symptoms which we will find in patients with myofascial pain syndromes. So signs, when you do, when you do a local examination, you will find tenderness on that particular muscle group. You, will, you might palpate taut bands. When you press pressure, when you put a pressure on these taut bands, there could be local twitch response, as I told you in earlier slide. You will find restricted movements. Sometimes you find latent trigger points, which are not painful, basically, which are silent. But when you do a palpation, you will find some trigger points there. Patient will jump when you, it's a typical sign called jump sign. When you put pressure on a trigger point, patient will jump in pain. So this is how you do the palpation. It's called slapping technique. You try to push the skin and then you will feel the taut band under your uh, tip of your finger when you're coming back. Or you can pinch or grasp this uh, uh, muscle group, muscle, and then you can feel the taut band in between your fingers. So this is a pathognomonic of a myofascial pain syndrome in that particular area. These are different points where you can find myofascial trigger points all over the body, in the neck, pectoralis major here, in the, over the thigh muscles, middle aspect of thigh, where you can find the, the back also, different points. So patient will complain a particular area. You know, if patient has uh, pain in neck and shoulders, you will find trigger points. Most commonly you will find trigger points in these marked areas. You can see here, radiation patterns of these different trigger points. If patient, if patient has a cruteal trigger point, patient might complain of radiating pain in whole leg. So sometimes it's a clinical dilemma. You, you are dealing with a patient who has, who might have some, you know, uh, pathology in the lumbar spine. You know, he might have some disc prolapse, but then when you palpate this particular area, you will find, you know, referred pain in this. So it's very clinical, it's very difficult to find but definitely it might coexist also uh, with these conditions. So it's, it's really the clinical, you know, you have really have to have a good clinical experience to find these uh, trigger points. And definitely you will go, if, you, if it's clearly showing it, you should treat first the trigger points, then you go for other deeper pathology. Same way here, you find trigger points and showing the radiation pattern in different areas. Another good slide which shows different group of muscles with their trigger points. Like you can see here in levator scapulae, trigger points are here, and patient will complain of radiation referred pain in this area. Similarly, in the neck, if you find in trapezius, patient might complain of pain in head and over upper neck. In scapula, especially when you see here in infraspinatus, patient might have referred pain in over anterior chest. So the idea is when you put the trigger, when you press this patient will complain of referred pain in this area. So it is good clinical sign where we can find these trigger points. Similarly, if you, feel, if, if you see here, trigger points rectus abdominis can cause referred pain over anterior chest. Similarly here in, in the lower leg, you can see so soleus can cause pain over Achilles tendon here. So you should be aware of these referred patterns. It's this one good thing is that if for one particular trigger point, you have a fixed referral area. So this will give you a good idea. There's another picture showing different muscle groups where you can find trigger points. For example, in head and neck, if you press over masseter muscle, you will find some thought band and you can have, uh, you can, you know, sometimes you will find that the reason for the facial pain is simple trigger, I mean, muscle spasm and trigger point over the masseter muscle, which, we, which you can treat easily, actually. Similarly, you can find like here, temporis muscle, a trigger point over temporis muscle can cause pain over the orbital area and leading to maxillary area. Like here, masseter 
head, superficial, you know, superficial part of the masseter muscle can cause pain over the mandible, whereas deep can cause pain. Uh, basically, patient may, might complain of ear pain also, apart from the uh, mandibular pain. Similarly, pterygoid muscles can cause pain in the mandibular area, uh, you know, auricular area, sorry, as well as in the heart palate. Whereas deep pterygoid can, little pterygoid can cause pain behind retromandibular area. So this very difficult, very, very important to do examination for these patients who are coming for facial or a chronic headache patients, you know. So there's, it will take only five minutes to palpate these areas, but sometimes they will give you clue and you can avoid doing a lot of expensive and a lot of detailed investigations. And you can simply treat these patients by giving trigger point. And once you give trigger point injections, uh, a patient responded well. So you will be able to, uh, you know, avoid some later invasive procedures, which can, which is not need, required at the point. So how you diagnose uh, the main, the major pillar for diagnosing uh, diagnosis of myofascial pain syndrome is basically clinical history and physical examinations. Although you can you can have some confirmatory diagnostic test, which is not required clinically, but you can do them also if you have the availability of these tests here in your facility. Like for example, EMG. When you do an EMG, it will show, the trigger point will show spontaneous electrical activity in that particular area when you compare with the non-trigger point. So it's like diagnostic. If you find, do EMG of that particular area, you are suspecting clinically trigger points there. When you do EMG, you will find spontaneous electrical activity thereby confirming your clinical diagnosis. Similarly, when you do thermograms, infrared thermography, you will find uh, hot and cold areas, corp, uh, in, you know, corporating with your clinical areas where you find trigger points, and then you can see their hot areas over those particular myofascial trigger points. Ultrasound imaging is very good, which is easily available uh, in most of the facilities. In, when you do ultrasound trigger points, you can see trigger points as hypoechoic regions with a heterogeneous echo texture. Recently, there is another mode of ultrasonography. It's called vibration sonoelastography, where you put a vibration and you put you certainly when you stimulate this, these muscle spindles or taut bands with a vibration, you will get an elastogram. You will get and that which you can capture by a color. Um, variance like this so uh, vibration is that when you when you put an external vibration elastography shear wave elastography is when you use your hand to create vibrations compression sonar elastography is when you put a pressure by probe so what you find is an ultrasound normal ultrasound you will find that this is a normal muscle and this is a normal color variance but if there is a trigger point you will find this hypoechoic area Right, which can very well correlate it with the color variance imaging, where you find a disturbance with the color here in this particular area. Similarly, you can find a taut band with a series of hypoechoic region areas in the muscle group in that particular muscle, uh, which will give an idea of a taut band. You can see here, and similarly, you can correlate it with the color variance here. This is another picture where you can see us typical hypoechoic trigger point with ultrasound. And here you can see a typical group bundle of these hypoechoic trigger points surrounded by heterogeneous area. There's another picture showing shear wave elastography in spacious muscle. You can see it's normal muscle here. There is no disturbance, but with the trigger point, you'll find some color variance there in these pictures. So ultrasound is very good handy mode where you can find uh, trigger points and then you can, same time you can inject them also doing trigger point injections. MRI is another, uh, sometimes able to find these trigger points with high T2 signal intensity. And same way like ultrasound, you, you, might, you may do MR elect elastography and and you can have elastograms displaying uh, color contrast in the images. 
it's a, basically for uh, uh, research purposes. If you do microdialysis of the active trigger points, you might find the different uh, nociceptive substances like substance P, C, G, R, P, and different tumor necrosis spectres. So it is just for research purpose. Now, differential diagnosis. It's very important because there are a group of myofascial conditions, musculoskeletal conditions, which you might confuse with uh, myofascial trigger points. Most common, it's fibromyalgia. Basically, it's a spectrum leading from a myofascial pain syndrome leading to fibromyalgia. You might find a patient with both conditions. You might, fi you might find a patient who has, you know, the, the myofascial trigger point, myofascial pain syndrome can evolve into fibromyalgia. So it's very difficult, but yes, there are certain characteristic difference between two conditions. Like fibromyalgia, basically, is a diffuse, it's a generalized condition which a patient have patient will complain more fatigue. There's more sleep disorders, uh, morning stiffness. Patient will you will find patient with depression and others, you know, anxiety and other mental symptoms, which you don't find in generally you don't find in patient with myofascial pain syndrome. And myofascial pain syndrome patients, they have a localized group of muscles causing them problem, not the generalized. So it's a good chart showing difference between the myofascial and myofascial pain syndrome and fibromyalgia. Pain pattern is basically local or regional in MPS syndrome, whereas in fibromyalgia it's generalized. Single muscle where you have generalized tender points, uh, you know, a number of tender points in fibromyalgia all over the body. Muscle spasm is more common in, in my fibromyalgia, uh, sorry, in uh, myofascial pain syndrome uh, in comparison to fibromyalgia. Trigger points and tender points. Trigger points is specific to myofascial pain syndrome, whereas tender points is specific to fibromyalgia. What is the difference? So trigger points cause referred pain. So if you find trigger point, you, you palpate some area and the patient is having a referred pain, basically you're dealing with a tender my trigger point. But if it is tender only, but it's not referred, then most commonly, and there are multiple points in specific areas, and patient has generalized symptoms, probably you're dealing with a fibromyalgia. Definitely we feel taut bent in myofascial pain syndrome, which you will not find in fibromyalgia. Twitch response is specific to myofascial pain syndrome. Referred pain, as I told you. Fatigue is more common in fibromyalgia. Sleep disturbance is there in both conditions, but more common in fibromyalgia. Paresthesia would be regional in myofascial pain syndrome, whereas fibromyalgic patients, they will complain of numbness. They, they will call you distal, you know, patient will complain of numbness and tingling in both hands and both feet. So it's basically distal and symmetrical. Headaches, headaches are more common. I mean, patients have a headaches in myofascial, but they are mostly referred as I show you pictures in my few slides. Whereas in fibromyalgia, it is occipital. Irritable ball syndrome and is not common in any other autonomic conditions. They are uh, they they are rare in myofascial, but they are very common in fibromyalgia patients. This is a picture showing points like in fibromyalgia. You can see the the, the points are very specific, and you need to have their bilateral points, and you need to have eighteen points, tender points according to American College of Rheumatology, but you can see the difference between the, in myofascial pain syndrome, you will find trigger points in particular muscle groups in that particular region, whereas in fibromyalgia, they are diffuse and they're bilateral and they're symmetrical. The group of muscles which, have, which can cause you myofascial pain syndrome. So I just uh, put one slide showing those muscle groups. Another condition which is uh, which you can confuse is polymyalgia rheumatica. But same thing, it's, it's a symmetrical myalgia. Patient will complain of stiffness in neck, scapula, and pelvis. Normally, you find this condition in people more, in patients more than 50 years old age, older patients. When you do lab, you will find ESR, high ESR, and C-reactive protein, which is not common in myofascial pain syndrome. And these patients normally respond nicely to a glucocorticoid treatment, which is not true with patients with myofascial pain syndrome. Fatigue syndrome is another condition, which is a systemic condition. Patient has complaint of extremely decreased level of personal activity with, you know, extreme fatigue, tiredness. You might find some secondary symptoms like pharyngeal pain, fever, lymphadenopathy, myasthenia. 
patient might have might complain of you know uh, low fever mild low fever pharyngitis but these things are not common in myofascial pain syndrome so it's it's not very difficult to differentiate patients with chronic fatigue syndrome with myofascial pain syndrome same with polymyositis which is an asymmetry condition you will again the, the muscle groups will be symmetrical you will find elevation of skeletal muscle enzymes when you do electromyography you will find myopathic changes if it is related with the dermal lesion it's called dermatomyositis which is not common in mps syndromes and when you do a muscle biopsy you will find inflammatory mediators in the muscle spindles which is not common with the mps syndromes so management what is the management of these patients management not we need to have a biopsychosocial ap approach only injections or local therapy is not sufficient for these patients because and we, sh we should have an integrative therapy including everyone physical therapist uh, if you need any you know uh, you can do intervention also of course you need to do prescribe a prescription as well as intervention approach to deal with acute pain but if you want a prolonged and long term benefit you need to uh, have a biopsychosocial approach so you start with uh, self management you you educate the patient about his lifestyle modifications depending upon your history you have taken with the patient you can suggest him to uh, modify his lifestyle correct his posture you know if he is uh, i mean if he needs to change his job if he has or if he is you know if he is a sports person you can tell them i mean you can guide them to modify their lifestyle and you can educate them education is very important so that you know you can avoid developing more trigger points of you can of future complications exercise is very important exercise has been found to decrease uh, it, it to help with the myofascial rehabilitation it will decrease the injury at the muscle spindle level it will help to secrete good hormones like serotonin which will help the patient to recover but exercise one thing is very important you should encourage exercise in a gradual manner because sometimes what happen it works negatively when you tell the patient aggressively to do exercise patient will do more exercise and then he has a flare of the pain so and then he has a negative feedback i mean so you have to tell him when you when you when you are encouraging the patient to do exercise you tell him to do start in a graded manner and if patient has pain more than 2 hours after the exercise it shows that patient it shows a flare up of the you know pain so you should tell the patient to avoid exercise in those cases otherwise if he is doing in a graded manner it definitely going to help sleep is another one thing you should inquire about and in case if the patient has a problem with insomnia you should you can give him prescription or you can have uh, you know basically you can advise the patient to follow sleep hygiene and other things to have proper sleep another thing which can be done for this patient is mind body therapy which includes relaxation and awareness techniques for example biofeedback you can ask the patient uh, particularly uh, i mean you can ask the patient when you feel stress which what are the things you can uh, patient will tell you when i have problem when i have pain particular group of muscles you can tell the patient what are the things which can cause you this condition you can you can ask the patient to go step back you know step patient can go step back and see what particular conditions are causing this type of pain so that he can have a feedback and then he can modulate those things you know so it's like a stress causing you pain and then you could go back find out the reason of stress and you can con you can control if you are able to control those reasons and then uh, it will help you in controlling this pain relaxation techniques are other techniques like breathing techniques guided imagery mindfulness yoga these are the good techniques which will help patient to improve not only local myofascial you know pathology but also general condition like sleep positive you know positive outlook in the in you know it can ha also help to 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 combat the stress and these techniques have been found to influence even autonomic balance to to decrease sympathetic i mean they 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 help to modulate autonomic balance also whereas if you see they decrease 
they have been found to decrease myofascial pain, including vasospasm, muscle spasm. So they have a lot of things to do. Just by simple mind-body therapy, by relaxation therapy, patient can modulate his disease progress. Now there are biomechanical therapies, which we can employ in these patients like postural. You can again go back and tell the patients about using proper postures, physical therapies, manual therapies, and needle-based therapies like trigger point injections, which I will discuss later. So the idea of biomechanical is to interrupt with the muscle spin, local, my, local muscle pathology. So they can help the patient to feel better, like muscle stretch. What you do with the muscle stretch, you just, the idea is to gently stretch the muscle group, which will cause the lengthening of the sarcomeres, thereby reducing the overlap between actin and myosin molecules. And in turn, it will cause decreased consumption of energy leading to abetting the energy crisis. But the important thing with this mechanical stretch is muscle stretch is that it should be done gradually. And sometimes when you do, when you overdo muscle stretch, it might cause stimulation of a sympathetic system leading to, again, uh, you know, increase muscle contraction and then this vicious cycle starts. So what happens when you do muscle stretch if the patient has too much pain, you can spray or you can, you can do a local, local anesthetic spray there like web coolant, or you can put a local gel there, any or, or like anything topical gel like diclofenac or lidocaine so that the patient will have less pain when you do a muscle stretch and then thereby you can inhibit the sympathetic stimulation. Same way, post-isometric relaxation technique done by a physical therapist. They do a contraction and relaxation technique, thereby improving the muscle pathology there. Local tissue stretch is similarly like muscle stretch. You just do stretching over the trigger point, thereby releasing the pressure of the trigger points. For the myofascial release, another thing where you can do manual therapy and you can put a sustained pressure to that particular muscle group. The, the idea is to stretch the fascia because there has been one study done where they find with where they injected saline with ultrasound guidance in different group of muscles, like injection saline between fascia and the muscles in between muscles. And we surprised to know that of patients, the reason for trigger point is that the trigger point found they were in muscles. So that's why sometimes this myofascial release helps the patient. Biostimulation therapy, another group of therapies, patients like laser therapy, tense, and stimulation, neuromuscular stimulation, as well as ex extracorporeal shockwave therapy. So, what the stance does in the patient? The tense basically try to induce. Uh, with us, with, you know, the, the, it tried to normalize acetylcholine concentration in the motor end plate with the vibrations, and thereby they suppose that it will help to relax the thought bend of muscles. Same way, interferential current therapy works, but it, it is deeper than tense, so it's found to be more advantageous than the uh, transcutaneous nerve stimulation. Extracorporeal shockwave therapy is also. Same, they trans try to transfer mechanical injury to the body, that particular area of myotrigger points and muscle tissues without damaging the surrounding tissue. The idea is same. They try to disrupt the end plates, try to disrupt the pathology there at the motor end plates and leading to, you know, decreased concentration, concentration of acetylcholine and thereby reversing the pathology. These are different modes where you can apply, like, this is interferential and neuromuscular stimulation here. Here you do individual trigger point electrostimulation, and here you can do low level laser therapies. As I told you, you have to do a multimodal approach with these patients. You can do manual therapies, you can do electrical stimulation, you can you have to do bio, you know, biofeedbacks, you have to talk to patients, you have to see all different, then only you will able to get a desired benefit in these conditions. Otherwise, if you go for just for injection, it will not achieve desired benefit. Now, trigger point injection is the gold standard. You all know you can do trigger point injections based on, you can do uh, on anatomical landmarks or you can do by ultrasound guidance. 
Uh, in trigger point injections, dry needling is found to be as effective as with a local anesthetic. But the thing is that with dry needling patient, uh, the advantage of using local anesthetic is that you, you avoid the pain because, because of needling. So in, in turn, I mean, you are avoiding any sympathetic stimulation. Therefore we find more benefit and it is more acceptable to the patient also. That's why otherwise technically there's no difference between dry needling and injection, you, you get the bet you get the uh, I mean, same benefit later on. But I think it, local anesthetic has an advantage as I, you know, it will decrease sympathetic response. Patient has more acceptance. Yeah. Even with the saline, you will find this, the study where even with the saline, they try to disrupt, you know, they do the patient saline and they try to, you know, wash out those inflammatory mediators and it, it also found to be benefit. Now, therapeutic, therapeutic ultrasound, same way as we are using the wave therapies. It, the, the benefit of the ultrasound is that you can, it can cause, uh, I mean, it's, you, you're not able to achieve benefit with the manual therapy. Th ultrasound waves can go deeper and they will more help. I mean, they will able to terminate the local energy crisis there. Same way you can use Local, as I told, local anesthetics, they will disrupt the pain by, you know, interrupting the sodium channel blockers, stabilizing the neurons, neuronal cell membranes, and thereby inhibiting uh, further impulse and conduction of the action potential. Lidocaine injection, it's found to be benefit until six months, but you can put a topical also, 5% lidocaine patch, and it has also been found useful. About saline, I already told you that it will help to dissipate and diluting the local inflammatory mediators there and thereby helping the patient. Botulinum also has been found to be useful. The reason is that botulinum will prevent acetylcholine release and thereby it cause decreased muscle spasm. So it also, prevents the release of pain neurotransmitter at primary sensory neurons. So they found that botulinum toxin is also being, I mean, you can inject botulinum toxin also, that particular trigger. But the thing is that you have to be uh, very sure about the trigger point because there you might cause my muscle weakness also. So you have to be very sure about the trigger point, then you can inject even botox. Acupuncture is also found to be useful in different studies, the idea is same. You will disrupt the these muscle spindles there, local pathology. Biochemical therapy also you can use. You can use NSAIDs. They will found useful, but you cannot use for long, obviously you cannot use them for long term. Topical diclofenac sodium is found to be useful. In I mean, the problem with NSAIDs is that you cannot use for long time, long duration. Cyclic antidepressants, especially with the patients with, uh, you know, head and facial pain, uh, they are found to be useful in patients who are have chronic depression, who have sleep problem. So they are just tricyclic antidepressants, as we all know, they are inhibitor of serotonin and non-epinephrine uptake. They also work on sodium channel and histamine receptors. They they have a significant benefit in myofascial pain syndrome, especially this particular group of mus patients who have facial pain and um, with insomnia or chronic tension type headaches or with chronic pain with TMG joint disorders. Muscle relaxants, they are found to be useful in these patients, especially if, if it's a resistance and you find a particular group of you know, severe muscle spasm, you can use central muscle relaxants like cy cyclobenzaprine, clonazepam, you can, they don't find any difference between tizidine and baclofen and dizepam, so any of them can be used. Tizidine is my particular choice. I normally use tizidine in the patient and I found it very, I mean, it's very beneficial instead of using baclofen and dizepam. It's my personal practice, but research says that there's no difference between these three muscle reactions. Now, the thing which we can do for this patient is RF treatment, which we sometimes we do here in a clinic because if the patient, Sometimes patients have a good benefit, but they come, you know, early. They just have benefit for two or three weeks. In those patients, normally we go for RF treatment. We just do, we just 
put some saline, phytotanimal, and this reduced RF in the muscle planes, basically. So you can use thermal RF or you can use pulse RF. Those areas where you are where you are not aware, I mean, when you're afraid of nerves, you can do thermal coagulation like tepezias, opaspirantus, gastronemias, muscle group. Then you can go directly for thermal coagulation treatment. You can set the temperature to 75 degree and duration 15 to 30 seconds. Whereas the idea is to disrupt the myofascial trigger points in the fascia. Whereas the areas where you feel that there are nerves around, you can use pulse RF like skeletal muscle, pyriformis, gluteus medius. The parameters can be set to 42 degree centigrade for 120 seconds. And you can use pulse RF also. The idea of RF is to produce a therapeutic effect by damaging the abnormal peripheral nerve, causing that local hyperplasia or hyperplasia. You can separate and releasing the contracture of the soft tissue and thereby you can improve microcirculation in that particular area. See, as I more emphasis, only the injection will not work. You have to find out, you have to correct the perpetuating factors, which is called, which is the real cause of the myofascial pain syndrome, whether it is stress, insomnia, whether it is abnormal posture or a particular group of muscles, which have been, you know, repeated activity or incorrect muscle activity, incorrect use of one particular group of muscles. So you have to treat patient overall. You have to find out the reasons. Then only you will achieve a you know, desired effect. Then only you will get the long-term benefits. So find out the perpetuating factors apart from the treatment you are giving. Try to correct them. If it has anatomical defects, you try to correct the muscle imbalance. Or if there is a systemic condition like poor sleep, stress, altered metabolism, you have to correct nutrition deficiencies. So you have to find those conditions and you treat them all together. Then only we'll find we'll get a proper benefit and proper pain relief in the patient. Yeah, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Himanshu. That was a very good run through of uh, of I would say it was a very very comprehensive presentation. You told us about the criteria. You told us about the ultrasound imaging and its use. You also told about what other modalities of treatments that are available. So let me go through the questions now. Uh, we have many of them. Uh, you have answered a few of them during your presentation, but let's do a bit of recap. So yeah. the question here is, how common is myofascial pain syndrome in cases of TM joint pain? Uh, so how common you come across this? I mean, so, uh, for me, in my practice, I think it's very common. If you have a TM yes. joint pain, it will make the masseter muscle go in spasm because yes. in general, the principle is you have a pain in the joint, the surrounding muscles will be affected. And yes. I think, uh, that's what- So uh, my idea is, I mean, it's, as you we know, it's very common. So if you, pay, if you get patient TM joint pain, try to examine him properly. Sometimes you will find trigger points there, a muscle a masseter spasm, and you can treat it very easily. You don't have to do, I mean, it's very common. Or, I mean, there's a great deal approach. If you have a patient with TMG joint pain, you, you give them, before you go for any intervention, you can advise them this mouth, uh, you know, uh, support. Sometimes it is just because of bruxism. Patient has bruxism and then when you inquire further, you find that patient has, uh, you can advise them this uh, mouth gets water, the plastic available there sure. during the sleep and uh, these devices. And because this is the common cause of muscle spasm. And then if you find trigger points, sometimes you find them and you can find the effort point, then you can go for intervention also. And once you do injection there, local injection, you will find the benefits. Sure. Now, what's yes. the role of Botox? You've already told Botox can be injected. Yes, Botox normally, uh, yes, all, uh, Botox normally we don't go first time. Yeah, but yes, Botox has a role, as I told you, it decreases acetylcholine release at the muscle spin level and motor end plates. So uh, Botox, if patient has good benefit with the diagnostic injection, but if he comes early, so sometimes we do Botox for these patients and hoping that this will affect, I mean, this will give him benefit for long duration. So Botox definitely has a role. In and what's the diagnostic injection? Do you just use local or do you use local steroid? And then- Normally, normally I use local. Yeah. Uh, I do just do local there and with ultrasound guidance. Yeah. And it's very important to do, uh, I mean, it's very, useful when you compare with the, you know, 
uh, based on anatomic landmark because in ultrasound you can actually you can see the twitch also there in the muscle twitch and you can inject the local there and you, you if you find that then patient has a good benefit you can go for botox definitely right and in terms of the amount of botox like do you have have you come across an article where the muscle is bigger you have to inject more botox or anything like that i would prefer to i mean at what particular point i i don't go beyond recommended dose but definitely if it's a good uh, if a big muscle you definitely will find able to find different you know trigger points there so you can inject there as five units as we do for you know for per day yeah, other, other headache, chronic headaches yeah this is a very good question it says what's the approach to treat central sensitization because of the chronic myofascial trigger points so yes if you have a patient with central sensitization it means now you know Lost the, the pathology has changed now. It's very difficult to treat. In these conditions, it's not only you have to do a local treatment, you have to start him on like tricyclic antidepressants. You can start. You have to go for a uh, proper drug therapy and biofeedback. I mean, it's very difficult to treat these patients once the central sensitization sets in. Sure. But you have to have a proper biopsychosocial model. You need a uh, you might you might have a, you might need a psychiatrist's help. You might have to refer to a pain psychologist. You you do your intervention. You do your you know what is expected from you the prescription and this. You need a physical therapist. So it's very difficult to treat. But yes, uh, sometimes you will find these patients have you know especially when you do a detailed examination, patient is completely fine. He has nothing. And then we know when you go detailed history. Then you will be able to find okay, this is the reason why a patient has such in this, and you try to correct life. I mean, it's a difficult patient, but yes, you have to have a multiple multimodal approach, mm -hmm. right? From starting from education and lifestyle modification, sure. and you will find definitely definitely will find some benefit there. So that that brings on to the next question: role of lignocaine infusion. So this patient with central sensitization, yes, come across yes. that applying lignocaine infusion might be a might be one. Yes, yes. Sometimes we do lignocaine infusion. Sometimes we might sort out for ketamine infusion also. So these patients, but yes, they have been found to be useful. But the research says, I mean, we don't have a, you know, a good data. But yes, they have been found to be useful in these and patients. Yes. One more question here: Can the patient have fibromyalgia and myofascial pain syndrome together? Definitely. Yes. You will find a lot of patients with have where you, have, I, as I told, it's a spectrum. Patient might start with myofascial pain syndrome and nigger with fibromyalgia, or you can find both both conditions in the same patient. It's very difficult. It, it's it's a spectrum of musculoskeletal disorders. You can find both. Uh, yeah. One more last question is: How about ozone injection treatment for trigger points? Have you come across any articles? People are using ozone therapy also, and it has been found useful, but there is no uh, the the level of evidence is, I mean, it's level C, but there, there are anecdotal reports where they, they did ozone. I personally have not used ozone for this condition because ozone is not available here. But I have seen literature, I have seen papers where paper, people have claimed, I mean, they have claimed that ozone injections help in this condition. Yeah. Now, I think that looks like we, you know, we have covered all the questions. It, does anyone have any questions? Please put in the chat box. I am putting the links for the YouTube channel as well as putting the link for the Facebook page. So if you guys want to actually access the recordings of this webinar, you can uh, access that on the YouTube channel and you can also join our Facebook page so that you will be updated with regards to the future upcoming events. So I've just put the links there on the in the chat box. So you can actually uh, click on the link and it will straight take you onto the page. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, especially on Saturday when it's a precious time to you know, either go out or spend time with family. You have dedicated your time for learning. So I hope we have done a justice to your time. Uh, and I must say thanks, Dr. Johan, for an excellent uh, uh, run through of the, the, the commonest condition that we come across as a pain physician in our day to day life. Uh, the myofascial pain syndrome. And uh, hopefully we will do the second part of the fibromyalgia in near future. We do have uh, 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 next uh, talk lined up tomorrow, same time, five o'clock. Uh, Dr. Amit Verma, 
uh, talking about shoulder pain, what's new. Uh, so I'm very much uh, kind of, you know, looking forward to that talk. And I'm hopeful that you guys will join us. Uh, and also uh, register that. There's a Facebook, if you go on the Facebook page, there's a link for registration. So the registration uh, is open. So please register. And then 21st of January, I'll put a link for uh, Dr. Jayabhatra's talk on pelvic pain, a team game. And that's going to be another excellent talk uh, by Dr. Batra, and we have two uh, physical therapists working uh, with Dr. Batra in uh, in the pelvic pain clinic, uh, and we do have them uh, talking to us about what modalities they use with these uh, complex uh, set of patients. So thanks very much, everyone, and have a great evening, and we will see you tomorrow at five o'clock. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye now. <laughs>